Hey guys, welcome everybody. Hello. Let me know if you can hear us. Uh, we should be live. In the chat down below or on your right, if you're on YouTube. We'll wait a bit until uh, more people are there um, before we start. We'll, we'll give them five minutes um, before we actually start. Mm -hmm. And now we wait. <laughs> you guys can hear us. Can you say something in the chat if you can understand us? Yep. There are some slight delay between uh, whenever we say something. Yeah, okay. Um, there's some slight delay when we say something on uh, YouTube. It's a bit less, less direct than um, um, Google Meet. But the last time we did it with Google Meet, we had like a million people asking, can I join? Yeah. Can I join? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So it's like, uh, let's try this on YouTube and hopefully it, it, it's easier. Um, Indeed. So for today, it's really a first, I think. Yeah. We're launching this on a new platform, on a new streaming platform. <laughs> so let's see if it works. Uh, so if you have questions later, you can pop them in the chat. Um, you can also join. I, I put a link in the chat. Uh, you can join the, the StreamYard studio. So if you want to join us and ask a question in person, you're always welcome here. And then we'll, we'll add you to the stream. Um, but also, if you have questions later, um, uh, just ask them in the chat. Um, if there are particular things that you already want to get out of the webinar, like things you really want to know, um, just put them in the chat already, so we'll try to, to highlight them when we go through our presentation. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's wait a few more minutes until everybody is joined. By the way, what, what, one o'clock, does, does that work for everybody to do, to do webinars at one o'clock? Or do you prefer to do webinars at night, like at seven, at eight, or actually during lunchtime at noon? Like, yeah, anybody has preference there? Um, one o'clock is just something that I, I randomly took and, and see how it goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that sometimes it's not compatible with calendars and meetings and everything. Indeed. Yeah. Well, in the evening, there is more opportunity. Yeah, it depends what your <laughs> situation is. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Some people uh -huh. have no time at night. Chris, do you have a view on the number of uh, people who are actually joining? So yeah, if you, if you go to YouTube, it's like 37 watching right now. Um, so let's, let's see, 38. Um, you can follow that actually somewhere. Um, Mm -hmm. So the, the streaming platform we're using is called StreamYard. It has a duck icon. Um, yeah. It's the first that we're using it. So Indeed. First time in production with StreamYard. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, sounds like you're speaking underwater. Oh, that's not good. Let me, let me see if I can fix that. Um, and, and when Bruno is speaking, that's, that's better or what? And when I'm speaking, that's on the water. Maybe I pull in my mic. Yeah. All right. Is this better? Hey, Frederick. Um, can you hear me better now, or am I still having, having this uh, weird audio thing? Maybe that's just the way I speak, right? I speak on the water. <laughs> Huge echo on your mic, Chris. Somebody, Lucas said. Ah, that's a bummer. Wait, I'm, I'm going to reset my mic just a sec. I don't know. That's a bummer because when we tested it, that wasn't the case. Let's make sure in the settings of your Mac, you selected uh, the road. Yeah. And also in the settings uh, on StreamYard. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Let's see. All right. 
is this any better or am I still speaking on the water? You check on my mic, that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> also, I'm gonna to switch to my to my uh, laptop mic. Reset your mic, Is it, no, it's not a Microsoft mic. I don't have Microsoft mics. Um, um, maybe, uh, is it, maybe I'm gonna try something. I'm going to, but it's going to exit solo layout. And do you hear me better now, or is it uh, still still muted? muted? No, that sounds like a laptop mic. Yeah, the weird thing I have this fancy mic here, but it's not it's not helping. Uh, but you've selected it correctly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, um, oh, that was an echo cancellation. All right, All right final try. Um, you have a better, better is, is this better, better or is it still as, as bad as it was before? No, test, test, because there was some echo cancellation that I turned off now. I think hold again. <laughs> no, so we can ensure you we're not in a bathroom. We can understand you. Although it uh, sounds like. But maybe Chris, let's get started. Yeah, I'm gonna switch to my. Yeah, no, let's get started. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll I'll switch, switch to, to my, my mic to my mic. laptop mic. Um, yeah, sorry about the echo. I think Bruno's mic is much much better. Um, but yeah, we'll 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 have to make do with what we have, I guess. Uh, now it's like you're in an arena, like a rock star. Last question, Chris. We have like a blue light in your mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's yeah. turned on. Yeah. I'm just checking. <laughs> anyway. All right. Let's get started. Sorry about the bad quality on my side. Bruno's quality will be better. It's a bit annoying because we tested it before we started. But yeah, there you have it. There's not much we can do now. Um, anytime you switch direction, uh, it's directional. Oh, shit. Okay. okay, no, wait, I'm gonna put this mic away because I actually broke it just here and now. <laughs> um, sorry, guys, I'm really, I'm really messing up here. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm on my MacBook uh, mic now. So, welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Chris, um, and to, I have with me Bruno. Hi. Um, today we're gonna talk about um, putting your machine learning code in production with or without a crappy mic i would say <laughs> um it seems fixed now yeah I, I switched to another mic uh, so so uh, that's why it might be fixed um what we're going to share today is a bit our experience of um, how we industrialize machine learning code we don't claim to have found any like ground truths that are true for everybody we just found some techniques and ways of working that works um for the companies we work for for our clients and for us um, I want to share those with you. We're also looking forward to your feedback and, and your questions about this. Yes, that's the interesting part, actually. All right. Um, I'm going to turn add some slides to this thing. Um, let's see if I can do that. Uh, wait, here we come. We're going to uh, add the slides. Yeah, there we go. But it's not. Oh. Yeah. All right. Um, ML industrialization platforms. Before we start, let's quickly introduce Data Minded. Um, who are we? So for those who don't know us, we are a data engineering uh, consultancy. We work with a lot of small and, and big Belgian enterprises and, and sometimes abroad. Um, we are a partner of Amazon, of Google and of Microsoft. And um, we like the fact that we're a partner with all three of them um, because we can learn from all three cloud providers. And it also puts us in a position to compare the offerings of, of the three cloud providers, right? And, and today we're gonna to focus specifically on, on their offering in, in machine learning and, and AI. Um, one other thing to note about Data Minded, if you haven't heard yet, we launched, uh, we launched Datafy almost a year ago by now. And yes, yes. Um, Datafy is a, is a productivity tool that helps you build um, uh, data products um, and really industrialize data products and machine learning algorithms can be an example of a data product that you want to industrialize. 
so we're going to see later uh, after Bruno has introduced um, machine learning how we actually integrate uh, that with, with Datafy. Yes, or at least the most important concepts that we think are important that we saw at clients, like how did we integrate it in uh, Datafy? Yeah. And this actually brings us to the, the main question of today, right? So which machine learning platform do you actually need? Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of them. Um, but mainly, we're going to focus on Azure Machine Learning, uh, Google AI Platform, and Amazon SageMaker. Um, why those three? Because probably you, you're one, or you're already on one of those three, or you will have to choose between one of those three. And so the, the first logical thing to do is to actually see, okay, but what is the null offering of those platforms before looking at third-party providers? But uh, all the, um, the, the insights and the recommendations that we give today, of course, are perfectly applicable to the others. Yeah, so um, we're not going to talk about what is data science and how you do data science, but just in a nutshell, what is the data science life cycle? You typically start from, and this is the crisp DM model, there's a million models, but, but this is helpful for us. You start from some kind of business understanding. Uh, based on that, you, you build a data understanding. Uh, once you, you have that, you do some data prep, you do some modeling, you evaluate the models, and if those models are good, you might potentially deploy the models. If the models are not very good, if your evaluation is negative, then you go back to, wait, what, what are we misunderstanding about business? But this cycle, um, we see a lot being uh, applied in practice. What is important here is that actually all of your machine learning only starts creating value the moment you are in deployment, right? So as long as you're doing data prep and modeling and evaluation, that's just costing your company or your client a lot of money, but you can only get value from your models the moment it's in production and the moment it is deployed. So that's why industrializing your machine learning algorithm is actually really important. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, how do, you, how do you approach that typically? Um, so you have, uh, if you imagine you have two axes, one is an axis of experimentation and the other an axis of initialization, where in experimentation, you try to find a model that answers your question. Uh, and in industrialization, you try to run that model reliably and automatically. Um, you have a few approaches of how you can deal with this. So a naive approach would be um, that you first work on industrialization and you spend a year or two years like building a perfect machine learning system with, with everything you can imagine. And only then, once everything is there, you start trying to test your algorithm. Um, we, don't, we don't recommend that approach. Why? Because um, if then you see that you can't really, your, your algorithm is not useful for whatever reason, you actually wasted a lot of time and a lot of effort and your business won't, won't like you very much. So on the contrary, what we always recommend is you start with experimentation. You start with Whatever you need to do, just um, try to prove that your model adds value to the business. And the moment that you're there, um, then you can talk about, okay, how can we industrialize this model? And by the way, it could be that you do three or four models um, that all prove out that they don't deliver any value. And then only the fifth model that you do actually is valuable for the business. All of that is fine um, if you start with the experimentation phase, right? Um, so definitely optimize for business value first. So what are some of the challenges we see in that experimentation phase? Um, if, you, if you look at it from startup perspective all the way towards large companies. So in startups, um, where they typically get stuck in experimentation is that they have no data. They have very limited budget available to even do experimentation. They might not even have data scientists on board, right? Um, and there's no infrastructure in place yet. So all of these things make it very hard for you in a startup to do any kind of experimentation. Then if you, if you move to bigger organization or things that are true for organization of any size is that you run a million experiments, but after a while you start losing track of your experiments. Um, debugging of these things can be very hard. Debugging your machine learning code is not super trivial. Uh, maybe you have um, a training algorithm or you have an algorithm that works really well on a subset of the data, but then if, if you actually run it on large amounts of data, you, your training becomes very slow or you might get out of memory. Also, um, you might build this great state-of-the-art model, but you don't even put it in GitHub yet. And then uh, what happens after a week or after a month, if you want to get back to that model, you have no idea of how to reproduce that, right? And then what are some of the problems typical to large organizations is just, even just for experimentation, getting access to the data, getting access to a service on which to run your machine learning, um, that, that is very difficult. You, you, many restrictions on your dev environment, you have firewalls to fight for. So these are the typical issues you see when you want to do experimentation. 
Then if you look at industrialization, um, that has its own unique challenges. Um, if you look again at startups, again, the, the challenge of not having in infrastructure, so it's hard to industrialize if you don't have infrastructure available. You have small or no engineering team to put your experiments in production, um, and you have to do a lot of manual retraining of models. Uh, that's what we see a lot of startups. Um, now, at any kind of organization, um, the notion of concept drift is, is something we see in practice a lot. So concept drift is the fact that your model might perform well today, but a month or three, three months from now, it's, it's, its performance starts drifting because of changing factors, right? Um, you spend a lot of time on retraining your model. Um, uh, you have to solve the, the case, like, do I want to do batch, um, batch scoring of my model? Do I want to do request reply? Uh, I want traceability um, of, of why my model scored the way it did. Uh, and in the end, if I really want to do in industrialization well, I also want to focus a lot on CI/CD. Um, CI/CD means continuous integration, continuous deployment. So it's not a manual, like I do 500 steps manually to get something in production. No, it should be an automated pipeline that automatically passes some tests. And if, if the tests are green, then you go to the next stage. Indeed. Mm. And then at a large organizations, where do we see them struggle with industrialization is that some organizations have this throw it over the wall mentality where um, you build something as a data scientist and then it's handed over to a completely different department with completely different people and they have to industrialize it. And, and, and there's a very low, low touch handoff between the two. Um, you sometimes have very inflexible compute environments in these large organizations. Sometimes you have to integrate with legacy systems, which, which make your model a lot more difficult to build. Uh, and also, and I think it's an underestimated issue, is um, technology stack fragmentation, where if you have 10 teams, they all choose their own technology stack, and it becomes very hard to, um, very hard to go from one team to the other or to keep a global overview of what is actually running in production at these, in these large organizations. So it's mainly the, the maintenance cost. Yeah. That's okay. a problem of uh, stack yeah. fragmentation. Yeah. So um, it's important to remember that when you do machine learning, the actual machine learning is just a tiny fragment of what, what your day-to-day -day life looks like. This is from a paper from Google about hidden technical depth in machine learning. There's actually a lot more to machine learning than just writing your machine learning code. Um, and actually Google has come up in another paper, paper with um, the three levels of what they call ML ops, so machine learning operations. And they say um, level zero is when you just manually build and deploy your models, that's level zero. If you want to go to the next level, they say, hey, you should actually build machine learning pipelines. And ML ops level two, if you really want to be a cool kid, then you have that CI, CD, you have automated retraining, you have concept drift detection, all the cool things. Uh, if you want to more, know more details, that's, uh, we linked the paper here below of ML ops. Indeed. Um, but the message here is that, yes, it's very easy to get a model running but then industrializing the model can become complex fairly quickly right indeed um, and so as an example of how we've done this at clients um, and this works again this works for us this this doesn't always work i'm not saying this is the only way it, you can make it work but as a, as a step process that we applied is that um, in the beginning like in your experimentation phase you do whatever you like right if you want to do notebooks if you want to do auto ml if you want to do drag and drop tools Whatever you need to do to prove that, yes, there is value in, in solving this business case and it's actually feasible as well. Um, so there you can choose whatever you like. And if you go to the next phase, if you say like, yes, I've done my initial experimentation, maybe start uh, storing your models in a model registry so that you can... Um, um, well, you keep track of all your models where they are like uh, or that model pr like proved to be working like, really well a time ago mm. uh, but where is it actually right just to keep track of everything you ever did so, like even if you say okay let's retrain a model we had like a couple of uh, months ago maybe you yeah. can easily track that yeah and that would be step one in industrializing your experiments step two would be is also what we often see um, um, if your, your notebooks, they become a, a big pile of, of mumbo jumbo code. So maybe start extracting some of that code out in modular data pipelines so that um, though they run more stable, they can be reused across models. Um, that's a big step in industrialization um, that we often see as well. Um, and then as a next step, you could uh, look at building what we call an inference API. So an inference API is just an, an endpoint that you serve um, and Somebody else can consume that API by just throwing some data at it 
and then you do live like request reply kind of um, scoring of your model um, and then finally if you really want to be super mature and focus a lot of time on that automated ci cd right um, so as you progress your because your cloud knowledge will will progress as well because what we see a lot is clients who've never touched the cloud before and all of a sudden they have to do machine learning in the cloud so your cloud knowledge goes up, the more you go to the right, your machine learning uh, knowledge progresses as well, your development maturity progresses. But ideally what you should see is an incremental addition in, in business value, right? Um, if you don't see business value being added at every step, then you should challenge if you're doing the right thing, right? So, so always make sure every step you do, business will become slightly happier with, with what you're doing. Indeed, and the evolution we present here it's something that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, it can be that in reality, it's, uh, for your organization, it's more important to first focus on this. Yeah. Um, but it's something yeah. we think is making sense. Yeah, indeed. So um, now let's dive into the actual content. Uh, this is a picture I put on LinkedIn. So if, if you look at the three big cloud providers, you, um, they all offer their own machine learning solution. You have Azure ML, AWS SageMaker, and GCP AI platform. So if you put them at the Mexican standoff, um, Bruno, can you can you share like who wins this Mexican standoff and why? So no one <laughs> is actually the answer. Um, so in my opinion, it's really it's completely a false dilemma, and, and the question is really wrongly asked in my opinion. Yes, there are differences and they are notable, but it's really not a deal breaker to choose um, one or not to choose one. Let's say. Right, and actually what I want to do with you now is to actually go over them one by one, not by slides, but actually by going through the, um, the UI, UI itself. So normally now you should see my screen. Um, right now we are on Amazon, on AWS, and I've clicked here through services, I went to the SageMaker UI. So this is the thing all your data scientists and data engineers will quickly become um, quite familiar with. But before we go any further into it, there's actually one more slide that I wanted to show, voilà, this one. And basically, there are some common components between AWS, Azure, and Google. And basically, you can categorize them in, in, in four big or three big groups, let's say. So the labeling and data, experimentation, and industrialization. And so services that all three providers offer are for automated and human-assisted labeling. So what do I mean by that? Uh, often in, in, a, in a startup, um, let's say you're building a startup to, to automate apple harvesting, for example, right? So all the models are there to do object detection, right? To uh, detect an apple, for example, but maybe you want to detect like if uh, an, an apple is already ready for harvest or not, right? This data, data or this data set maybe doesn't exist yet. And so you can use these tools that will already label a part for them. And for the part that it's not sure about, you can use like human assisted labeling. Um, another one is um, access to just open data, like all open data sets that already exist. And so you, with this, you mean like AWS, Azure, and GCP, they all offer automatic and human assisted labeling. Yes. That's out of the box. You don't need to do anything. You just use what they have. Yes, exactly. Got it. And the same goes for the, 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 the upcoming five um, services i call them mm. for experimentation so basically they offer you notebooks so you don't have to that all the data scientists in your team have to run their own notebook no you can just say on the uh, here run 10 notebook instances they can be shareable yeah um training jobs uh, let's say you have like a super huge data set which needs to be paralyzed on multiple machines you can't on your laptop because it's limited in resources training jobs are really super cool for that the same goes for hyperparameter tuning jobs. So those are for to actually tune your algorithm, right? So the performance of your model is depending on the parameters you put into it. So that, that's, so it will run like in parallel a couple of training jobs. You can go like easily up to 100, but of course you will also pay for it. Uh, another cool thing about for experimentation is that uh, the, uh, they, they offer the task to specific models and services. So I'll, I'll take the example of object detection back again. Um, you don't need to write any code for it, basically. So basically, you're, you're leveraging the, the model that AWS has put into production uh, to do this. Uh, but they also have the same for text-to-speech, for example. You don't need to, to, to download the latest weights or of a model and, uh, and play with it in, um, in a notebook. Mm -hmm. 
but you can, as a baseline, for example, you can already try to play with those parameters, right? And lastly, they will offer outcome, which is basically, here is my data, here is my target, find the best model that, that's based on the data that predicts my target the best. Right, and as model initialization is actually the interesting part, so they all offer a model registry, so please register all your models. They all offer batch inference. So for example, I want to run my model on model data that came in at 2 a.m. every morning, right? So it op it's optimized for throughput. Whereas request reply inference is more optimized towards latency, right? Um, so those are a bit like the two big um, directions you can go through. And then the last one, concept drift, of course. So what you're trying to predict over time, the statistics of it will change. And um, so you also want to detect that and at least trigger a retraining of at least trigger something, an action to, to, to take. And lastly, they also call up for data validation tools. What I mean by that is um, if your model is only getting null, null values or bad values, um, you can also detect that easily. Um, and at last, you can also chain different operations together. So for example, uh, do a hyperparameter job, then do a training job, and then deploy it, for example. And that you would do it in a pipeline. Um, so let's go back to the UI. So everything I just said, basically, you can find it here on the left as a logical uh, place to go, right? So first of all, for example, SageMaker, they offer two environments for notebooks. You have SageMaker Studio, which is basically um, a managed uh, Jupyter lab. So you create a domain. You would create a domain per team or per project. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, you can also just launch an instance where a notebook is linked to it, which is uh, I, both have pros and cons. Um, a notebook is just it's just a, a Jupyter notebook, right? Indeed, yes, a Jupyter notebook or a Jupyter lab, even. So Jupyter lab is like the more elaborate type of notebook, uh, which has some more features than just a Jupyter notebook. Um, for the rest, uh, if we continue here, processing jobs. This is do your to do your data pre-processing. Um, you could do that here. You could also do that ev anywhere else. Um, and now the more interesting ones, a training job. So basically it, ke it keeps track of all the training jobs you ever did. So for example, here on the first one, it failed, right? It immediately tells me like what failed. Um, and so it also tells me like how long did it take um, on what, under what role and what type of instance it, it has run. Uh, but also you can export metrics, uh, like nothing earth shattering here. And here you can also, um, your training jobs, you can choose, I want to run on GPU instances, I just want to run on CPU, you can choose exactly. the hardware you run on. Right? It's fully flexible, like single instance, multi-instance. Um, multi yeah. um, also, you can, like, let's say you don't want to code, you can just say, hey, I just want to use that type of algorithm, then AWS will select their own algorithm. So maybe I can quickly show this, right? Create training job. And here you can see, like, choose SageMaker built-in algorithm or your own algorithm which means you point to a place where your code is, uh, but maybe let's not go too much into details. And then would you say, would it be fair to say that um, if I can just pick an off-the-shelf algorithm that I don't really need to be a data scientist and me as an engineer could do this, or would you say no, because then you're, you're missing, you're, if you don't understand what happens behind mm -hmm. the scenes here, you're, you're not going to be able to find a good solution. Right? I think it's fairly easy to really get the, 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 the essentials, right, of what the model should be and how it should perform. So I guess, sure, even if you don't know all the details about PyTorch, TensorFlow, scikit-learn, go ahead, try it out. It's, it's really fast. Um, but in my opinion, it's, it's those algorithms are great to just get you started to set a bench, uh, benchmark, right? Also the auto ML tools of AWS, they're exactly made for that. They're, they're there just to get you a first be uh, bench line while you're experimenting, okay. right? And if that's good enough, you can go to industrialization with it. If not, um, you'll need to do more manual work, right? Uh, but that's the, uh, that's the point why data scientists are still there, I believe. <laughs> 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 but that's maybe a bit too opinionated. <laughs> Um, just to quickly go over it, so this is a model registry of AWS, not really that spectacular, just a list, basically. Um, and you have endpoints, which is basically an API endpoint, where you just say, hey, use that trained model and put it behind endpoints. Uh, and the same goes for batch flows, where you can uh, schedule one every morning at 2 a.m., use that model. Okay, um, that was it. Uh, maybe also for AWS, what I also like here is the documentation. Maybe I can show it here. In my opinion, it's it's uh, it's quite clear. 
So if you want to get started documentation or examples, even better on GitHub. Actually, I've listed them here in the slides. I'll maybe put them later in the comments uh, yeah. for the just to get started if you would be interested. But just for sake of time, let's go to the next cloud, which is, as you can see, Google Cloud Platform. So how does it work? It's like AWS and GCP, it's a bit different. In GCP, you have the concept of a project, right? And you have roles that are in a project. So right now I'm in a project called ML Indus Webinar, mm -hmm. uh, and it will group all the resources related to that project together. So mm -hmm. if you have like a, a cloud storage or, or um, a data proc or data flow objects running somewhere, you can all group it. Um, so for for enterprises, it's already a quite nice feature to be able to group uh, these things together. This is something that AWS doesn't have. In my opinion, is really a big bummer. Okay. Um, AI platform actually is quite similar to just uh, the AWS platform. So you also have your data labeling jobs. Um, yeah, actually, I haven't done anything in this account, so I wouldn't be able to show you that many that many things. My goal is really to, to guide you a bit through the UI. Um, yeah. So here are the notebooks again. They can be Jupyter notebooks, but you said earlier they can also be the Google Colab notebooks if you like those better, right? Yes, you can run a Google Colab notebook uh, also here on AI platform itself. Right. Uh, but you can see here also it, it quickly spin up an instance uh, with already PyTorch in it or a TensorFlow. Yeah or just uh, the, the basic things. But it's also super easy to create your own environment. The same goes for AWS and for Azure, right? If you want to create your own instances. Yeah. As I said, you also have the concept of pipelines, which means you can stage all these things together. So the, the tuning job, the training job, the deploying job. Um, uh, this is where actually all your jobs would be. Um, yeah. This is the Google AI platform. But of course, Google Cloud is all about services. So now I'm going through all the products slash services of Google AI. So you see all the big data tools. But for AI, for example, you see here the recommendations AI. So basically, you don't have to write your own recommendation engine. Mm -hmm. You could already start with just using the, the services they have. Mm -hmm. And basically, this is also maybe a, a war that's going on between AWS, GCP, and Azure, and that's like, which one will release the most services which you could use out of the box. And in my opinion, right now, it's it's, it's really Google who's winning uh, at the moment, right? Five of 10 years, I don't know how it will look like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they even have like what you showed earlier, they had a talent solution, right? So it's an out yes. of the box way to search for, for um, uh, new employees for your company, right? So that, that's what it does. Yes, indeed. So to, to, to match employees to a specific role, uh, basically, well, uh, but also just to manage job postings and everything like that. And like, is this candidate a good candidate or not? Um, yeah, so you will see on Google platform, this is just the beginning of all their services. There will be many more uh, coming in. And then lastly, uh, I'm sorry if I switch a bit fast, we're going to Microsoft Azure Machine Learning. Here the same, um, so in Google GCP, we had projects in mm -hmm. Azure ML, or let's say the Azure environment, you have resource group. So that's the natural way on to group uh, cloud resources to a certain project. And so right now, um, this is actually for a client at MBS, but <laughs> uh, normally that there isn't, that there is nothing that uh, shouldn't be shared, so I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, but basically you have workspaces that are tied to a certain uh, resource group that are tied to subscriptions, but that's maybe a bit too technical. What I like about this UI is you come into it and you immediately see what failed and what didn't fail, basically. Right, so here I have all my runs, my training jobs, my hyperparameter tuning jobs, my deploy jobs, they're all here. Whereas my computes were like, what is running? What succeeded of running? What failed for some reason? Uh, but again, uh, you have all your standard things like, hey, I can use notebooks. Um, you have a quite explicit way to use AutoML. So at Azure, they really try to push you even more to use AutoML. As you can see, I actually also use it just for the, um, the, uh, the initial, to set an initial benchmark, like what type of models will work, what type of feature initialization will work. Uh, it's, it's really basic, like they don't do all the fancy stuff and that's other automated feature engineering package will, but yeah. it's really a beginning.
It's, it's good, as you say, to set a baseline first, run, run AutoML, and then see if you can improve on that. Indeed, yes. And then designer, so Azure ML is the only one who offers a drag and drop interface, mm -hmm. right? So maybe for business analysts, this can be a, an easy way to get started. Yeah. So you don't need to know Python from the beginning, you just need to know the concepts. And of course, you this sucks you into the Azure ML environment, right? And then how they <laughs> um, provide or, or all the inputs and outputs. You're learning Azure ML, basically, yeah. and that's the con. Um, similarly, you also have the definition of what a data set is. You can have experiments, right? And you have a runs associated to a certain experiment. As you can see, I'm a very good data scientist by using horrible names or like non-indicative names. Um, then the pipelines, it's also quite an important one. So as you can see, this is really for experimentation. All the ones are failed, mm. <laughs> but as you can see, I, it's really, can ramp up quite easily. But to maybe cut the chase to the most important part, Azure ML, of, I, they, they offer endpoints for real-time and batch type of um, workloads as well. But, and this is the, the best part of Azure ML in my opinion, it's, that the, it's the way how you pick your compute platforms. Whereas on AWS, for example, you just I, you spin up instances that are tied to a specific experiment uh, or training job. Here, you, you spin up a single instance, mm -hmm. a cluster of instance, which actually scales quite easily. Also on Google, it also scales quite easily, by the way. But mm -hmm. um, but also for inference, you just you can attach it to a um, Azure Kubernetes service cluster, um, but also all the other options. And that, so, that, uh, linking it to an AKS cluster, that's different because in, in Amazon or in Google, it's you cannot link it, you cannot deploy it on Kubernetes, basically. You always deploy it in their own little island yes. somewhere. And you don't have much control over how that's happening. Indeed. Okay, cool. Indeed. Yeah. Um, yes, and that's actually the main points, or like just by looking through the UI. Um, and so if you would ask me the next question, okay, but what are the big differences between those three? And my answer to that is it's, it's actually quite hard to really pinpoint uh, those. So it was really hard to find a clear that's good or a clear, it's really not good. But I attempted yeah. <laughs> to do it. And so for Azure machine learning, it's really like the, the flexibility in compute options. I really think it's it's one of the, the, the strong points. They're also cheapest if you just look at the virtual machines, the, the, the price per hour. Of course, it doesn't say anything about the total cost of ownership. So for that, you should always look at your own situation. Mm. Um, so that basically doesn't say that much, right? Mm. Um, of course, as a data scientist or a developer, you spend quite some time in documentation. Uh, that was a quite frustrating experience for me here and there. So that's why I put cumbersome documentation. Uh, the same goes actually for Google AI platform. Whereas for SageMaker, in my opinion, has like quite clear uh, documentation examples. But of course, and that's something for all three, they have beautiful examples uh, mm -hmm. that uh, certainly in their marketing, their tech marketing sales, let's say. Uh, but if you want to go if you want to do something outside of it, it's, it's always a bit hard. And there you, you rely on the, the basic documentation of the services, like the API documentation. And it's really for, for that part. Like, what if I would just want to do something a little different from the basic examples? Yeah. And that's really, in my opinion, where SageMaker shines. But for the rest, it doesn't really shine anywhere. Mm. Whereas for me, Google, it's, it's really the, I really like the AutoML tool. I don't really have the time to show it today. Uh, but also the services, in my opinion, like for example, if you want to, um, uh, let's say you want to, um, ah, for um, how do you call it? Like say, is a text good or not good? Like, uh, um, but sentiment analysis. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for saving my ass. No, the the in that. So let's say you want to you have a body of text and you want to know um, do people think it's a positive thing or is there a positive feeling about this text or negative for yeah. example right they all offer tools or services to to i to, to train that without any code yeah. but the difference is for example in google ai they also support dutch okay yeah. for example I, yeah. yeah well depends but it's like small things like this like in my opinion google has like the broadest offering or they support the most case yeah, yeah, got it, got it. yeah. Mm -hmm. because it's always like that like the, the all these services they're nice until there's like a small, a small thing that's like not applicable to your case and it makes it unusable. Okay. Let's start, let's maybe take a step back, right? And try to wrap it up. 
So what we really try to say is, so if you're a startup and you still have the luxury to pick your cloud, um, what we really recommend is start from your needs. So I have this very boring slide uh, in front of me, and it was a bit also the point mm -hmm. <laughs> or the message I want to bring across, like really start from your needs. There, there is really, like what you really want in the first phase is to look for that low hanging fruit, look at your current capabilities that you have inside and pick something based on that. Yeah. Because switching afterwards, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy, but I think as a startup, you're, you're against a deadline, right? Yeah. On the contrary, if you're an enterprise, we say, uh, just stay with your current cloud provider. Why? Because feature-wise, um, they're all going into the same direction, a bit like uh, social media, yeah. like I say. By the way, I'm still waiting when LinkedIn will introduce a story feature, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or a TikTok-like uh, something, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, the main point is, is really don't change cloud because uh, I be, let's say you're on, on, on AWS, but, say, but uh, Azure ML has those two extra features. It doesn't make any sense. And so the analogy that I really want to make is like a small German saloon car. They're all pretty nice. Yes, they're, they're a bit different. Like the small, uh, there are a few features that are a bit different, uh, but in the end, they're, they're all usable. And that's a bit my, my main message about um, okay. these three. And also more importantly, um, those ML platforms, they can get quite expensive at scale. So if you're running like five models end to end on those platforms, that's fine. But yeah. if you're going to, let's say 30, 40, maybe 100, 200 uh, models in production, um, then we don't recommend using those AI platforms. And that's, we'll see in a minute what we would do in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so our general recommendation goes as follows. So you have the experimentation phase, then there is a green light to go to production, and you have the industrialization phase. For experimentation, we say just pick the tool you're most productive with, right? And you really want to focus, or as an architect maybe in that organization, you want to focus on fast iterations, uh, self-serviceness, and easy debugging, right? And those ML platforms are really, they're really helping for that. Whereas for industrialization, you really want to focus on reliability, traceability. What I mean by that, like when everything goes wrong, you quickly want to see why it goes wrong. So this is, there is this principle of observability. And last and foremost, maybe the um, avoiding technology fragmentation, which we see often uh, at clients and it's not really a well-known one. Um, and so what we say is as a startup or as a small organization, and you only have like three or four models to put, models to put into production, use the options of the ML platforms. Whereas for an orga a large organization, uh, look how to integrate those models into your existing data engineering uh, chain. Yeah. And, and that maybe means to not deploy using SageMaker or Google AI. There is a small asterisk here. And it's of course, as a startup, when you see that the, the costs are, are starting to rise, or let's say suddenly privacy becomes a thing, um, and, and you, uh, you need to have a more restrictive data permissions uh, thing right? or, or um, infrastructure, data governance plan, everything. Yeah, then you start to look at, um, at, at this. Uh, uh, we would give the same recommendations we give to large enterprises. So you mean also yeah. start at the ML platform, don't move them out as soon as you hit the high cost issue or the data permission issues? Or yeah, or the instabilities, like you need more stable ways. Um, right. And so there's also one last question that remains here. Okay, that's all uh, very well. Uh, but how do we go from experimentation to industrialization in a good way, right? There is actually a good architectural recommendation that we can give, and it's to decouple all your science code and your engineering code. So for PyTorch, there is already a platform that exists. It's called PyTorch Lightning. And basically what it does, it will remove all the boilerplate you have in your code um, and have like a, a separate science part of the code and a separate engineering part of the code. Okay. This is of course nice for PyTorch, but what about the other platforms, right? Or how do you deal with ML platform integration? Mm -hmm. And for that, what we advise is to use or adopt project code templates and standardization. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by that is, let's say tomorrow you start a new project in your uh, organization, uh, you go, you use something called a cookie cutter template, which is basically a tool that generates a project structure. And it has already set up everything for you, right? It has uh, some, some folders. It, it has already set up maybe the ML platform integration, CICD integration. 
the scheduling the, or the data access or even the logging. So all the boilerplate you don't want to do. And this is really what accelerates uh, large organizations at the end. Yeah. Also, as a, as a small thing, as a data engineer, it removes the data scientists um, from, from notebooks. So notebooks are nice for exploration, but please don't use them in production in large yeah. organizations. And also, uh, please do use um, Git from the start, so version, ver versioning control of your models. Yeah, so maybe a quick word about how we apply this at Datafy, but I, I won't spend too much time on this because I want to leave enough time for questions. Yes, indeed. Um, but so maybe if you go to the next slide, uh, what we try to do with Datafy, remember, is we want to accelerate data product development. What does that mean if you have a, a component that is machine learning in your pipeline? Or actually, if you, if you go one slide further, it's actually very simple. We we treat your mach machine learning job, whether it's a training job or a scoring job, we, we, we we uh, approach it as just like another part of your data pipeline. So in this example, you could have some um, some data that you ingest from a source with a Python script or with a Spark script, and you land it in your data lake. And then the next and that could run on Kubernetes, or it can run wherever. And then the next step, you want to do some training job using TensorFlow, and actually you want to run that thing, training job on a SageMaker. Then we don't really care where that runs. With, with Datafy, you can choose, okay, this runs locally on, on, on our cluster, this runs on SageMaker, this can run on Azure ML. We don't really care where it runs, as long as it fits, and that was what Bruno said earlier, make sure that it fits in your overall data engineering chain. That's what we try to do here, that you don't uh, lose track of the big picture. Mm -hmm. And then how that looks in, your, in the UI is that you can see, just like you see a normal ingestion job or a normal, let's say, ETL job, you can also see your machine learning jobs. You can ju just see them running in the same environment. You can track the performance. And then if you want to dive into the specifics uh, of uh, what's happening with a machine learning job, you can click on the link and you'll be, you'll be forwarded to that uh, platform where you can debug further there. That, that's high level the gist. So uh, for those of you yeah. who know a bit what Datafy is already, we're not trying to replace or compete with the machine learning platforms because there's, there's a million out there already and there will be a million more. What we try to do is give you the big picture of what are all the steps in your data pipeline, what, who is responsible for them, what is the quality of what they're running. We also try to push the template thing a, a lot that you said earlier that, hey, here's a cookie cutter template, fill in the blanks, this is how you trigger a machine learning job here or there, um, and this is how you integrate it with the rest of the flow. Yeah, also, indeed. So what what's also important, like SageMaker, Google Platform AI, but also Azure ML. Um, the coming five years, you can be sure that they will release a ton more features and yeah. try to to, uh, to to keep up with them as, uh, also with, with their budgets VS. Yeah. Data files budget, that's almost impossible, right? Uh, but but and as a nice thing, we can use everything they, they, um, they bring out. You just want to integrate with them in the end. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And with that, I, I want to leave some, some room for questions. Um, so uh, make sure this screen is big. So if you have questions, post them in the chat or you can join us. I think I put a streamer link all the way on the top. Um, we have one question already, which I'll show you on the screen from, from Matt. Yes, if you have the Python scripts already, how will you industrialize based on your explanation? Because if I understand well, you need to put your code in notebooks to benefit from those services. No, actually that's not true. So basically you can use a Python SDK as well um, to integrate. So you, you, actually we, we don't really advise to use notebooks. It's nice for in the beginning to really uh, to iterate quite quickly. But after a certain point, you want to write your own module with the model codes. And from uh, next to that, you want your engineering code which calls the, the SageMaker API, for example, or whatever API, that launches a training job with that file that you just wrote. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just what you said, you could use notebooks, but it's really not a, not a necessity, um, and even more, if you can go without a mm -hmm. notebook, can you just trigger your Python code directly, that would actually mm -hmm. be our recommended approach. Um, yeah, and then you can see which, you can choose yourself which components of the ML platform you use, right? Do you want to use the model registry? Do you want to use the, the model inference parts? Do you want to just want to use them for the modular data pipelines? You can choose which, which components are valuable to you. I, I hope that answers your question. Um, are there more questions? Uh, things that weren't clear in the, in the presentation or um, things you want to know more about? 
I'll, I'll give you I'll give you some time to write them up because there's some delay between uh, between YouTube and, and and what we see here live. So, <laughs> but even though the the comments should be quite uh, instant, they should, they should in my instant opinion, it, uh, uh, maybe the sound isn't or the the. the Ah, Bruno caught the echo virus. Okay, but yeah, I muted myself <laughs> somewhere halfway through the thing because apparently my mic was, was causing a lot of the, the echo. So okay, yeah, yeah. that's a action so, point for next time. Maybe Bruno, mm -hmm. until somebody mm -hmm. else has a question, um, you mentioned in the beginning there's a lot of other platforms that we all skip now. We only look yes. at three of them. Have you tried playing around with any of the other platforms out there, and, and can you? Can you explain a bit how are they different from what they are that is available on the mm -hmm. um, uh, on, on the cloud platforms themselves? So of course, first of all, they all have to compete with the big three, right? Mm -hmm. uh, today, so they they need to take a quite different approach. Um, so some try to integrate with Kubernetes, well, for example, uh, Kubeflow. Others try to simplify everything and, and, and don't use AWS or Google or anything. They just they say like, hey, this is a de development platform. It doesn't care about what cloud it's, run it's running on. Okay. Um, so that's like the, the Neptune AI, Comet ML, uh, yeah. weights and biases. But, I, and, but most of those don't have all the features I mentioned, right? Um, Kubeflow has, it's like the most complete one. So and actually, you need to know Kubernetes. Yes. So maybe uh, as a side note, the, the biggest competitor to these three is Kubeflow. Yeah. And what is Kubeflow? It's basically like also a platform for machine learning, which runs on Kubernetes. So it has been developed by Google. By the way, it's easier to develop to, to yeah, anyway. <laughs> I was just going to say that Kubeflow, it's really easy to, to deploy it on, on GCP. But yeah. it's it's, it's uh, because they made it basically. Yeah. But Wasix Kubeflow is basically just uh, a collection of open source tools that they just nicely wrapped into one uh, configuration file, basically. Okay. Uh, but what does it? I, it it is maybe a bit more bleeding edge in terms of uh, how flexible are all the um, the services. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest plus of Kubeflow is really like it doesn't care on what cloud it's on. You just need a Kubernetes cluster of it. Mm -hmm. um, but and that's the, the biggest downside of uh, Kubeflow. Uh, and that's really a, a big pain in the ass to, to set up. So I challenge anyone to set up Kubeflow in less than 30 seconds <laughs> on, 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 on one of the cloud platforms or you're a real a command line guru. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's really a pain. It's also to maintain it because it means that for all these components, mm -hmm. They all have a certain version number. For example, Jupyter Notebooks, but then you also have a component for the, the load balancer, mm -hmm. which is also fixed at a certain number. And as the, so if you want to deploy this in a large organization, this means that you need to manually check every month, is there one of the components that has a newer thing and do integration tests? And yeah. whereas on SageMaker, Google AI, it's all managed for you. Okay, cool. There are a few other questions popping up mm -hmm. now, so let's, let's quickly go through them. Uh, Lucas asks, let's say if you want to deploy an algorithm on your kid's robot car, is there any way to export a model to a binary or something like that? Uh, well, I guess a model is a binary, right? Mm -hmm. so, so then um, whatever you put in the model registry, if I understand it correctly, that's already a binary, so you can take it from there and then deploy it um, on yeah. your IoT device, if you like that. Exactly what the question is really saying. Okay, I have this very, I have this environment, this compute environment, uh, that, that it's really uh, restricted in in the amount of resource that it has, mm -hmm. and all I, they all have deployment options to over or let's say the frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. They all have frameworks to reduce the final model and okay. to just have a, a binary to deploy it. Now, there are also some integrations with Edge devices from all the, the big three cloud providers. Mm, um, of course. Yeah. They integrate with their own services. Of course, yes, that's, <laughs> and that's the point. But I don't have any personal experience with those. But yes, right. you, you can do that. Cool. Let's look at the next question, because now questions are popping up. So um, Nadam asks, what about integration with cloud <laughs> DevOps services? And if you, um, how you would manage critical paths for ML use cases like automatic retraining, logging, monitoring of deployed models, data drifting? Um, maybe you can go first if you have yeah, a view yeah, on that. Yeah, sure. So um, it, it's explained a bit earlier in the webinar already that I, I think what you mean, Nathan, is a CICD story that, that we have here. Um, you can perfectly well train a bunch of models and then test it on a subset. 
And then in your CI CD system, say that, hey, you need to reach at least this accuracy. And only if you go above that accuracy, then you deploy to production. There is nothing automatic or built in into these systems that I know of that can do that, but you can configure your own CI CD system uh, to do that, right? Um, the same with logging and monitoring of deployed mm -hmm. models that you can already do. You can look into these into these frameworks and see how your model is performance in re performing in real time. Mm -hmm. So that you can do. But integrating in your own CI/CD system, as far as I know, you have to do that yourself. Right? There's no magic button that says do no. CI/CD, right? Well, the thing about CI/CD is you want just you, you just want to do it once. You want to create templates for all the other teams, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and then you just keep this one Uber template up to date. Right. So there's really just one person going through hell, so to speak, or yeah. so to say. Uh, let's to let's set quickly it up. go yeah. to the next question uh, because now, now all of a sudden questions are popping up. So perfect. And all ops concepts are listed at the start, uh, but were not presented in details. Any return on experience running fully automated solution like testing, training, deployment, drift detection, and retraining? Huh. Oh. Any return on experience? So, can you share a bit about um, if you build a fully automated solution? I, I guess that's the question, if I understand it correctly. Which parts of that do you see? Are you struggling with the most? Uh, the testing, the training part, yeah. the deployments? I think that I'm not sure. I hope I, hope I, I asked the question correctly. Yes. Yeah. Well, so to say, so first of all, the, the DevOps uh, level two, mm -hmm. uh, according to Google. Uh, I've never seen it in reality. Yeah, okay. So that, that's really already something to say, like how complex it is to actually get it in a large organization at that level. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to answer the question, maybe like what, what are the hard parts? Uh, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is 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 really to like all this automation. It needs to be triggered somehow, right? Yeah. And it will always depend on on the, the 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 application you're running. So for example, you have fast moving. Um, let's say environments, for example, um, like like churn prediction or mm -hmm. like customer behavior. That's something that can change quite uh, fast, and you, you're mm -hmm. and everything inside your chains will need to change very rapidly. And there also the the, uh, the benefit of CI/CD is, of course, way bigger than, for example, when you're just trying to predict is this apple ready to be harvested or not. Mm -hmm. um, and there, what is the hard part there is really like, when, when, when is it triggered? What should you do exactly? Do we involve manual process still in it or not? Yeah. Um, so for example, another example, if you're doing something around health, right? Or, or um, predictions that are, that are, or that have some impact. Uh, let's yeah. say you're doing like, like um, lung cancer detection, yes or no. I think uh, it, it all boils down again to like building an automated CI CD system that actually measures the performance of your algorithm and then makes mm. smart decisions about can you deploy it to the next stage, can you go to production? Yeah. That's a really hard thing to do, right? That's that's not something you typically easily set up in an organization at one, two, three, and it really depends on, on the use case that you're having, right? Yeah. 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 But to comment on uh, the, the MLOps, the full fledged one, it's 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 mm. really hard to get right for all different types of use cases mm -hmm. inside an organization. Yeah. The next question I like, Felix asks like, hey, um, using any of these ML AI platform, is there any need for a startup to invest in Kubernetes knowledge? Ha, very good one. <laughs> Kelly, I, I like the question because uh, we, we, we also have a love-hate relationship with Kubernetes. Like once it's up and running, it's really powerful, it's really cool. And mm -hmm. uh, when we show a data file that actually runs on Kubernetes, but we've also seen startups and, and big organizations hurting themselves with Kubernetes. So I would say Kubernetes is really only for those organizations who are at a decent scale and who have the, the manpower to handle it. Indeed. And so if your startup only does ML and AI and they, they don't need a fully fledged uh, platform for like handling 20 different use cases with a lot of different uh, angles and a lot of different um, people working on it, I don't see a reason why you would investigate invest in Kubernetes right now. I, I think for a startup, Getting getting your machine learning model live, you should be able to do it all within within uh, those solutions, right? Yes, that's also what I would suggest. Like, don't try to bring in Kubernetes Kubernetes if you don't need the full flexibility yet. If you can just do it with existing tools inside the cloud, mm -hmm. do that. Yes, you will be tied to a certain cloud for some time, mm -hmm. but uh, as long as uh, the number of services are limited, it's not that hard to then move to a Kubernetes uh, model in a later stage. That said, it's really cool, right? Yeah. If you have things running yeah. on Kubernetes, but 
I, we see organizations move too fast to it. Uh, so, so think twice before you do that. Mm -hmm. um, one last before we wrap up because it's almost time. So Lucas asks, how transparent are the built-in algorithms on the three platforms? Say you uh, find one of the AutoML algorithms is performing well, how can you get into the nitty gritty and internalize your knowledge? How transparent are the? I'm trying to reread the question. Eh? So, yeah. Lucas, uh, how transparent are the built-in? Um, basically, so you can be sure that under the hood, under these AutoML algorithms, it's it's in the very first stage of these AutoML things. It's basically other free, I like scikit learn uh, behind it, or XJBoost, or LightGBM, or CatBoost. Uh, I know that Google is also pushing a bit more their TensorFlow frameworks as inside those algorithms. Um, how are the ones that perform well? I think it's really, it depends on, on the task itself. So some tasks are easier than others. Like for example, a like a binary classification task will probably more easily get great performance just using AutoML, whereas like, uh, a full-fledged, super custom uh, regression delay prediction thing on the Belgian train network will not work with AutoML. <laughs> That's what we try to do. But <laughs> All right. cool. with that, I see there are some more questions, but we'll, we'll contact you um, uh, personally. We have to wrap up here. It's, it's time. It's, it's 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks all for watching. I, I hope it was useful. Um, if you want to give us feedback, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, also, if you have more, yes. more information, get in touch. And, um, Please see do. See you on the next webinar. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining. <laughs>